Okay, hi everyone. Um, so my name is Rachel garland Irvin. I work in the National Net Gain team at Natural England um, and Nick and I are here to talk to you today about BNG. So um, as I said, we're here to talk to you about today about BNG and specifically how this applies to your sector, so parks and green spaces. Um, we're going to give an introduction to BNG and explain what it is, where it's evolved from and the different delivery mechanisms for it. We'll then look at some of the details in terms of the role of these green spaces in delivering um, BNG and some of the requirements for that, and then move on to consider how BNG fits into the wider objectives of delivering for local and strategic priorities. And then finally, what can be done now in advance of the commencement of mandatory BNG to prepare for day one? So to kick us off, the definition for BNG is shown on screen here. So it's defined as an approach to development and or land management that leaves the natural environment in a measurably better state than beforehand. And that aspect of measurability or being able to quantify the losses and or gains is really important to the definition. So the biodiversity metric is the tool which allows this to be done. Um, and the process for this will be explained in much more detail on, on the next presentation, which will focus on the biodiversity metric specifically. So BNG is intended to reinforce the well-established mitigation hierarchy. So the principle um, that environmental harm resulting from development should be avoided in the first instance, adequately mitigated where it can't be avoided, and then only ever as a last resort compensated for. But importantly, under BNG, as well as following and reinforcing the principle of the mitigation hierarchy, it's also recognised that even where habitat loss is avoided, so even where habitats are retained, there remains an opportunity to enhance that habitat, so to improve its condition, for example. So some recent background as to where BNG has evolved from in terms of policy. Um, the 25 year environment plan was, was published in 2018 and that talked about embedding an environmental net gain principle for development, including housing and infrastructure. That same year then also saw on the amendments to the MPPF, which discussed minimising impacts on and providing net gains whereby net gains for biodiversity. And then this was updated again in 2021 with the where possible wording that was discussed previously um, removed in this 2021 update. And then the Environment Act again rule assent on the 9th of November 2021 and the part in which we are interested in terms of BNG specifically is part six, so um, nature and biodiversity and that's where BNG kind of sits. So why do we need BNG? Um, for years, biodiversity has been routinely lost through development um, and BNG provides the most significant opportunity in a long time to reverse that trend. So the, whilst the general principles of no net loss um, and things like biodiversity offsetting have been around for some time now, the new biodiversity net gain policy creates a mandated process for development. And that requirement is a big shift in policy, um, creating a more standardised process and also with the framework and tools to support it, acting as a driver for nature's recovery. And with this, BNG can, de can deliver a multitude of benefits for nature, but also for people, places and the economy too. So for nature, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. It contributes to nature recovery through the creation of new and enhancement of existing habitats. But for people, it can improve health and well-being by bringing nature to the doorstep and creating more attractive places to live and work. And then for the economy, it can finance green infrastructure and nature based solutions, um, helping to increase the resi resilience of towns and cities. And it can also help green create greener neighbourhoods um, that are more attractive places to live, work and do business in. And then for landowners specifically, it can provide a sustainable long term income opportunity. And I'll touch on that again a little bit. So as we said, um, the Environment Act will mandate BNG and some of the key components of mandatory BNG are shown on screen here. So the Act applies to England only um, and it will amend the, T the Town and Country Planning Act um, and the 2008 Planning Act for NSIPs. Importantly, it will mandate BNG in the planning process and it will become a requirement for most developments to deliver a minimum 10% gain in biodiversity compared to, the, compared to their baseline values. The Act goes on to state that the calculation of BNG will be by way of a mandatory biodiversity metric and that there will also have to be approval of a biodiversity game plan with the BNG habitat being secured for a minimum of 30 years. There's also a statutory duty to manage and maintain a national register of BNG delivery sites as well as the introduction of a statutory biodiversity credit scheme.
OK, so in terms of the delivery for biodiverse net gain um, under mandatory BNG, there will be three possibly possible delivery routes. So if I start on the left, so on site, so many developments will create biodiversity units and try to deliver their 10 percent BNG on site within the red line boundary of their development. And that will be through a combination of habitat enhancement and habitat creation works, most likely. And much of that is also likely to, to form um, green infrastructure features. Secondly, um, off-site delivery. So it's not always going to be possible or appropriate to achieve BNG wholly on site. So for example, if there's existing good quality habitat or if the site has other constraints on what they can deliver. And for those situations where wholly on site BNG is going to be practically difficult, developments can look to deliver part or all of their BNG off site through the biodiversity unit market. And off site BNG delivery should be directed by things like local nature recovery strategies and other nature strategies and policies. So helping to deliver those habitats that are either located in optimal locations or of specific type that is recognised as being important in that area. And then finally, on the right hand side here, um, we've got the statutory biodiversity credit scheme. So it may be, particularly for day one of mandatory BNG, of specific types of habitats that, that sufficient off-site biodiversity units aren't available to purchase. And where that's the case, and it's been agreed with the local planning authority, but I must stress that only ever as a last resort, um, a developer can purchase statutory biodiversity credits from the Secretary of State. So the statutory credits will fund large scale um, strategic habitat creation works that look to deliver nature based solutions. But as I said, they're intended to be a last resort and habitat should be delivered on site or off site in the first instance. So as I said, for those situations where developers aren't able to deliver enough biodiversity units on site, they'll need to look to purchase biodiversity units off site in the market in order to fulfill the, up, the unit uplift that they require to get to that 10 percent. And in this manner, the Environment Act has essentially created a new environmental market. So the trading in biodiversity units, when buyers of biodiversity uni units, um, so that will be developers that require additional units to fulfill their minimum 10 percent gain. And sellers, so for example, landowners, um, maybe private landowners, maybe local planning authorities or environmental NGOs. Um, when those two come together, there's this demand and supply, and it's this which creates the market. So it may be a direct exchange between the buyer and seller, that is the developer will enter a private agreement with a private landowner, and there will be a direct exchange of monies for the provision of habitat creation or enhancement, which provides X number of biodiversity units. But where that doesn't happen, there could be brokers or land agents involved that put the buyers and sellers in touch with each other and take a fee or commission in the process. So that's a bit about the market and off-site delivery. And I'm now going to hand over to Nick to take you through the next few slides. Thank you very much. Many, many thanks, many thanks, Rachel, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, delivery of BNG and kind of how to achieve local strategic outcomes. Um, my colleague Claire will talk about the relationship between net gain and, and the green infrastructure framework. And then I'll just come back and conclude with some thoughts around things that, that uh, can be done now in terms of parks and green spaces to prepare for, for mandatory net gain. Um, so, so one of the challenges that nature face is the fact that we know there's an ongoing kind of nature crisis um, and part of the Part of the, the cause of that has been also often a focus on just delivery into protected sites. This was a, a phenomenon that was identified in 2010 by Professor Sir John Lawton, who highlighted that actually we need to create much better join up um, across um, landscapes to make sure that the kind of nature can um, occupy new sites and buffer existing sites, uh, create new stepping stones and corridors. And there's a real opportunity here for um, parks and green spaces, both existing ones and also potentially new ones, so to come in and play a role in this. And BNG can help to finance the delivery of these. So next slide, please. So one of the things that Rachel talked about was that in the uh, Environment Act, there's also these local nature recovery strategies uh, referenced. So there are going to be uh, 50 of these, um, about 50 of these um, set up around uh, covering all of England. Um, and what these do is they create a, a kind of local spatial framework that highlights where there are particular priorities for uh, nature in a local area, both in terms of uh, protecting existing areas, but crucially uh, identifying opportunities where, where nature can be further enhanced um, and also identifying particular types of habitats that are of value in a local area. And 
biodiversity net gain um, and the metric that powers it, um, which you'll hear a bit more about later on, includes within it a mechanism that enables the targeting of areas that have been identified through local nature recovery strategies. Um, so for anyone working in parks and green spaces, um, firstly, make sure that existing uh, these existing spaces are, are reflected in local nature recovery strategies. But then also there's an opportunity to say, actually, how could new kind of uh, pocket parks, for example, um, or other opportunities be identified that can help to kind of connect some of these sites or buffer them, particularly potentially where there may be uh, kind of local wildlife sites, for example. Um, and collectively, this this network of, of local nature recovery strategies uh, build up to a kind of national picture of, of a nature recover, a national nature recovery network. And so there's a mechanism inbuilt within BNG to help kind of start to target the delivery of these kind of locally important, locally strategic outcomes. Next slide, please. The other thing that BNG can do is it can help contribute towards placemaking. Now, we know that this is quite a, a, a key agenda, both for developers and uh, local planning authorities, local residents, in terms of how to make uh, local places uh, more sustainable, kind of greener, uh, more attractive places in which to live, work and invest. Um, and, and BNG can help provide a financing mechanism to do that by either kind of enhancing existing uh, uh, kind of uh, green and blue spaces or helping to finance the creation of new ones and the attendant kind of biodiversity that goes along with that. Um, one of the things our collective experience of COVID demonstrated was actually how much we all value access to green space. But we also know that that's quite inequitable uh, around, you know, in, in terms of kind of some people not having uh, access to it locally. So again, BNG, because it's got this kind of potentially 30 year plus kind of funding trail uh, to it. And one of the questions in the chat was, um, can the does the financing cover that full 30 years? Yes, it should do. Your pricing should reflect that. So it can create this long term financing opportunity to help you kind of create an investment into uh, some of these new spaces and, and create these kind of complementary green assets at the same time as reducing pressures on existing uh, green and blue assets. So I'm not going to hand over to Claire. Uh, to talk about the, the green infrastructure framework. Yeah, thanks, Nick. So um, next slide, please. So, um, yeah, I, I'm Claire Warburton. I'm the principal advisor for green infrastructure in Natural England. So work closely alongside Nick and Rachel. And um, one of the ways that we are working specifically to focus on green infrastructure and parks and green space is through the green infrastructure framework. Um, and that'll be a, a voluntary approach um, that, that works alongside statutory mechanisms like biodiversity net gain and local nature recovery strategies. And it'll provide a, the tools really to develop that strategic approach for green infrastructure. Um, and we very much see biodiversity net gain as a mechanism for financing um, that those improvements uh, and enhancements to green spaces. So through the framework, we're aiming to improve existing green infrastructure uh, and create more good quality green infrastructure that provides those benefits for uh, not only for nature, but the wider benefits that nature can bring for health, for climate and um, for prospering communities. Um, and we want to ensure that everyone has access, as, as Nick said, to good quality green infrastructure provision, particularly in those areas where there's not enough accessible green space or where that is of poor quality, uh, particularly in areas of, of high deprivation or health inequalities. Uh, and we particularly want to mainstream green infrastructure as a, as a key infrastructure in helping to create and maintain those sustainable places. Um, and um, so we're looking really to, um, to embed uh, green infrastructure in um, planning systems. Uh, and we're working closely with DLUC uh, to, to incorporate the green infrastructure framework into planning policy uh, and um, guidance. Our priority audiences for the standards are planners, developers, parks and green space managers and communities, including neighbourhood planning groups. Um, but we're also working with stakeholders like health, transport, education, um, whose policies can also help to deliver a green infrastructure. So you go on to the next slide, please. Um, so a bit more detail really on the work within uh, the green infrastructure framework, which which is a fulfillment of the, the 25 year environment plan. Um, and last year we uh, launched the green infrastructure mapping database, um, which is is shown here on the slide, a snapshot of that. Um, and that really has sort of helps. Um, that is a database of all green and blue infrastructure across England uh, and can really help to identify those places that have um, 
have a poor um, amount of uh, or quantity of provision of green infrastructure, um, particularly in, in areas of high deprivation. Um, and we also launched our 15 principles of good green infrastructure. So they're also shown on the slide here. Um, and they can help that to, to shape what good networks of green and blue infrastructure look like. Uh, in the next stage, uh, we'll be launching our headline green infrastructure standards, and those can be applied locally to raise standards around the quality, the quantity and the accessibility of green infrastructure to deliver the outcomes set out in the 15 principles. So those, as I said, those standards will be a, a sort of key tool in the planning toolbox, um, and we're working with DLUC to embed those in, in national planning policy and guidance. And they'll include standards, um, so uh, a standard for green infrastructure strategies, so to work alongside um, local nature recovery strategies to support that strategic planning of, of green networks. Um, they'll include accessible green space standards that will drive the ambition for everyone to have good quality green and blue spaces within 15 minutes walk from home, particularly in those areas of high deprivation and high health inequalities. Um, they'll also include quality standards um, based on Green Flag Award criteria and local nature reserve sort of status. They will also include um, a new national urban greening factor so that sort of sets a weighted factor for percentage of a development or of an area that is green, um, at helping to sort of set those, those ambitions for um, area wide development um, context green cover across towns and cities. Um, and they'll also include urban tree canopy cover standards um, around setting uplifts in targets for uh, urban canopy cover. And they'll include standards for the management to mirror the, the biodiversity net gain period for 30 years. Um, and particularly want to sort of draw out the way that things like urban greening factor can help to um, work alongside biodiversity net gain, especially on sites with um, no uh, baseline biodiversity or limited sort of baseline biodiversity, they could help to drive urban greening in those areas, uh, particularly in relation to the green infrastructure that can be delivered on site. So um, the standards will be accompanied by a design guide that will set out how to design good green infrastructure as part of new development. Um, and um, we know also that um, the green infrastructure mapping work that we um, developed has um, been very helpful in terms of providing, uh, identifying those places that, that need additional investment. So for example, they were used, it was used to help to target uh, Deluxe nine million pounds of levelling up parks fund. So just finishing off this slide, we'll be launching the full framework in uh, at the, including the standards, the design guide, a series of process journeys for planners, development managers, developers and neighbourhood planners. Um, on the 31st of January, um, so do watch out for um, um, that we'll be sort of promoting that um, across uh, various different networks. So we'll provide the link uh, to APSI um, to to that to that event so you can book on to that. Thanks, Nick. Back to you. So things to prepare for, for mandatory net gains. So next slide, please. So um, many local authorities already have local net gain requirements now anyway. Um, as Rachel said, it's already in the National Planning Policy Framework. Um, so, so do uh, have a look to see whether your, your, your authority's got existing requirements. Um, and they will maintain or they'll, they'll, they'll stay uh, in place until this mandatory approach starts. The key difference with the mandatory approach when that commences, expected to be uh, November next year, is it introduces a kind of a, a broadly common approach uh, across England. Um, so everyone will have to use the same metric. Um, everyone will have to deliver at least a 10% net gain. Uh, developers won't be able to challenge on viability grounds if they're being asked to deliver a 10% net gain. Um, local authorities could vary that percentage upwards, um, but it would be well, yeah, it'd be advised to get some additional evidence if looking to do that. Um, anything, as Rachel said, that's being delivered in the mandatory system will need, to, where it's being delivered off site, will need to go on this, this national register. 
um, and also um, be secured um, for a minimum of 30 years. That's whether it's being delivered on site or off site. If it's on site, it's secured through planning uh, conditions. If it's off site, it's secured through through legal agreement. Um, and then a kind of long term, a kind of monitoring requirement on that as well. So it moves away from a, a potentially quite variable local approach to a more consistent uh, national approach or one that still allows for for uh, elements of, of local variability to it. Uh, next slide, please. So some things to, to think about um, when thinking about it, introducing and preparing for mandatory net gains. So, so there is this requirement for a minimum of 10%, but as I said, local authorities can go or aim for higher. If you do that, then ensure that that's set out in a local plan um, and that there's evidence to support that as well, particularly if a, um, a developer looks to, to take that, you know, looks to challenge that as well. So they won't be able to challenge at 10%, they potentially could be on. So, so look for evidence around that. <clears throat> Think about whether <clears throat> the actually existing green and blue spaces um, are appropriate places. Um, many of them are well, yeah, for yeah, good places for enhancing uh, nature in them, but not all will be you know, completely suitable, or there'll be bits of those sites that aren't necessarily suitable for, for enhancement through net gain, but, but yeah, many of them will be. Um, other factors obviously impact and, and influence the management of, of, of open spaces around um, whether they're kind of the landscape character, any particular historic interests, and the, just the fact that yeah, they're, they're used by a wide variety of, of, of people and communities as well. So it would still be really important to take those communities uh, with you on a journey around actually <clears throat> this isn't a site that's been kind of left to go wild, so to speak. It's it's being done to to, to create a, a kind of beneficial outcome for nature that hopefully is designed in a way that the you know, the local communities will benefit from as well. So that community engagement will be, remain a, an important factor. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but also to you're entering this uh, this world of a market, so there is a real kind of financial opportunity um, here, and as well as an opportunity to deliver better kind of nature for for local communities. One of the first things to do is get familiar with the metric, which you'll be hearing a little bit more about in the next presentation, and, and start baselining the site. So, yeah, what are your existing habitats on there, and how could the value of those be improved, or how could you create additional habitats? Also, um, the more you can understand what local developers are going to need, uh, so what are they looking for the market to provide them for? What types of habitat are they looking for sites that also offer some of this additional value that, that Rachel alluded to as well? So, so opportunities to engage with local developers to, um, to make yourselves attractive as a proposition to them. Um, and then um, delivering those local priorities can actually be, as I said, quite, as, as Rachel highlighted, quite an attractive thing for those developers. So, so, so you know, de making, you know, uh, developing those relationships with them, but also thinking about what's in the local nature recovery strategy as well, <clears throat> influencing it and also looking at how you can align what you're delivering in your, your parks and green spaces with what's been identified in those strategies as being needed for nature as well. So it could be things like increases in tree canopy cover, addition of additional hedgerows, um, new ponds, those sorts of things. And keep an eye out for um, some no regrets messages that will be coming out shortly from DAFA as well. Again, that will set out some more information about things that planning authorities and others can be doing now uh, to prepare and get ready for, for mandatory net gain. And then next slide, please, which I think is coming to the end. So just to highlight some um, sources of further information as well. So. Um, you've heard a lot from myself, uh, Rachel and Claire this morning. Um, there's a lot to take in there. There is a growing amount of additional information and resources out there. Um, a really good site is the Planning Advisory Service uh, kind of pages on biodiversity net gain. Um, there's also a Natural England introductory brochure. Um, we have a blog for anyone that's interested in uh, kind of testing some of the digital services associated with net gain, like the register. Um, professional bodies like SAIM, Syria and IEMA have published best practice principles for, for development. There was also a British standard published on biodiversity net gain, a kind of process standard uh, to be applied. And then also the Landscape Institute uh, produced some professional kind of FAQs as well for uh, for biodiversity net gain. So um, hopefully with the you know, you'll be able to click on those links with the slides when you when you get those. And um, that's it from us, I think. So thank you very much. I think that was the, the final slide. It was excellent. Thank you very much, um, Nick and Rachel. That was that was really good, actually. Uh, and it was generating lots of questions in the chat box to the side, which I know some of them we've been answering some of them as we're going along. But we'll we'll what we'll do is we'll come back to those 
uh, at the Q&A session at, t at 10.45. Uh, perfect timing. Uh, I, I love it when it hits its time. And it actually, uh, we've actually got an extra two to three minutes for the next one. So um, how lucky are you? Um, next speaker speakers are uh, Finn Goddard, who is Specialist Biodiversity Net Gain, and uh, Mungo Nash, Senior Specialist Biodiversity Net Gain, both from Natural England, and are going to talk to us about an introduction to the biodiversity metric. Over to you. Hello, everyone. Yeah, so my name's Mungo, and I work in the team responsible for developing the metric. Um, so yeah, I work for Natural England within the NetGain Metrics and Indicators team, so does Finn. Um, I'm going to be taking you through the metric, uh, giving you a background of it, and kind of um, delving in a little bit more detail into what it is. Um, could I have the next slide, please? So um, we've spoken about the metric in, in terms of development, but the metric's been designed to be used by developers, land managers, um, on-site, off-site providers, not necessarily in association with developers. So it's quite a broad tool, um, but um, specifically it, it kind of does have, this, um, does have this relevance to development, which is why we're talking about it. But while we've been developing the tool, it's, it's kind of been developed as a broader tool for measuring um, changes in biodiversity. Could I have the next slide, please? So um, Rachel, Rachel's already told you biodiversity net gain is an approach to development and or land management that aims to leave the natural environment in a measurably better state than before. So this, this keyword is measurability. Um, so the metric is a tool for auditing and accounting for biodiversity losses and gains. So it's been developed um, to, to measure these these changes, um, it uses habitats as a rough proxy measure to translate into biodiversity units. Uh, it includes terrestrial habitats and intertidal habitats plus linear habitats, and it's split into three modules. You've got your area area units, your linear units, and your rivers and streams units. Um, so it works by taking a baseline score and forecasting a proposed outcomes and comparing the two, and um, it's it's been developed um, to provide confidence and consistency, consistency in approach. Um, it's simple and it aids communication to non-technical audiences. Um, although it's simple, it's underpinned by ecological evidence. Um, it's gone through several rounds of consultation um, with input from habitat specialists, NGOs, LPAs. Um, and the current version of the tool is 3.1, which um, the statutory metric will be um, heavily based on. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Um, so the metric's been developed with the mitigation hierarchy in mind, and, and the mitigation hierarchy is is kind of weaved throughout the metric. Um, but it do, it does it's kind of key to point this out that the the metric doesn't replace existing legislation. It's additional to it. Um, it provides a confidence and consistency of approach for for mandatory net gain, but it's it's not a decision making tool it's just there to aid decision making it doesn't override good ecological advice it doesn't override um kind of good ecological common sense um could i have the next slide please um and yeah so the the metric should be used by a competent person which is typically an ecologist um so the metric has some limitations because of the way it's been designed, because it um, uses habitats as a proxy biodiversity. It can only measure the relative worth of habitats. Um, so it can only compare habitats to other habitats and, and, and the unit outputs that it provides are kind of not absolute. They're, they're kind of a rough, um, a rough guide of the relative worth of that habitat compared to other habitats. Um, so they're not scientifically precise or absolute values. So it's just worth bearing that in mind when you're talking about the metric. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Um, so to access the metric tool, um, it's hosted on Natural England's joint publication page. Um, next slide, please. Um, you'll, you'll find a toolkit there with a calculation tool, uh, some condition assessments, a user guide and a technical supplement, which goes into more detail. Um, I would really encourage you just to take a look at these documents and play around with the metric because some of the things I'm going to be speaking about today are quite technical and they might not necessarily make a whole lot of sense and they take a lot of time to understand. Um, so it's, it's worth kind of playing around with the tool, condition assessment, user guide and technical supplement. 
um, having a look at those documents in details to really understand how the metric works um, because uh, metric 3.1 is going to be uh, essentially the template for the statutory metric so it would be good it's it's good to take a look and um, see those things in more detail um, could I have the next page please um, so one of the things the metric measures um, is condition um, so condition is uh, a measure of habitat quality in relation to its type uh, so you would have two grasslands of the same type um, condition is one way of um, distinguishing between the two so the metric has good moderate and poor conditions and it uses condition criteria um, to, to distinguish between um, to distinguish between these and these condition assessments are required during the baseline habitat assessment so you would have your ecologist going um, out into your site and conducting these condition assessments um, and and they can also be used to kind of feed into the design process um, at the start of the BNG process to kind of think about the things that you might be able to do to um, increase condition of, of a habitat within your site. Um, that's not necessarily, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not meant to be a replacement for any kind of um, established guidance on habitat creation or enhancement that's out there. It's really just a guide. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So um, this slide's really here just to just to kind of highlight that um, the metric is <laughs> or applying the metric is a, a multi stage, multi step process, but it's, it's really key just to get that metric input right at the beginning at step one during your project planning. Um, you kind of want to um, look at where your site is um, as Steve and Rachel have, um, as as Nick and Rachel have mentioned, think about um, what kind of habitats your developer is going to want, um, what habitats you have on site, what's what's within um, the realms of possibility, what are your restrictions within your site and kind of feed all those into the metric when you're when you're filling it out. Um, and uh, it's, it, you'll see there that it's a iterative process. So step four feeds into step one. So you might find um, useful to use the results of your metric to improve your design and communicate these gains and losses to people. Um, so could I have the next slide, please? So through development of the metric, um, we've kept in mind uh, some principles and rules. Uh, these are just some key ones that I've highlighted. Um, so the first principle is the, the metric doesn't change the protections afforded to biodiversity. It doesn't, um, it doesn't kind of consider species, it just considers habitats as a proxy. It, uh, it doesn't supersede or override any other protections or, or obligations or mechanisms. Um, it's additional to that. Um, and also the metrics kind of um, been designed to encourage the enhancement or not transformation of the natural environment and and one of the ways it does this is through the trading rules which is rule three um what the trading rules are is um it kind of it's a simple statement that that losses of any habitat should be compensated on a like for like or like for better basis um can talk about more um the trading trading rules more uh in detail later um and then the rule four um, as as the metric kind of moves into its statutory space and it becomes the statutory metric, I think this is quite important, is that the biodiversity units generated by the, the metric are unique to a metric and cannot be cared, compared to other, other metrics or other units. Um, and uh, there's some animations, could you just uh, click a couple of times and they'll pop up on the screen. Um, Uh, and, and again, please, thank you. Um, so um, just really key to, to highlight that, you know, that the metric generates uh, three types of biodiversity units, um, area units, hetero units and river units. Um, those those units can't be summed, so you can't offset losses of uh, area habitats with hedgerows. You can't offset losses uh, to rivers with, um, uh, with uh, ponds, for example. Um, so, um, and then the other thing to point out that the metric does not uh, cover irreplaceable habitats or, or habitats um, of very high distinctiveness. So those, those habitats which are afforded the highest protections already um, and, and kind of those habitats which can't be accounted for through the metric and, and should, you know, if you're applying the um, mitigation hierarchy, you would be avoiding those habitats completely. 
Um, could I have the next slide, please? So um, I've spoken about the three modules of the metric. Um, you'll see here that um, uh, if you open the calculation tool, you'll get, you'll get to the main menu um, and you'll see a series of buttons in front of you which kind of represent those modules. You've got those in green, uh, which are the, your, your habitat units. So each of those buttons, A1, A2, A3, uh, you click on those buttons and it'll take you to a data input sheet. Um, you've got the same for hedgerows and um, your rivers. So you've got your three modules in, in green, brown and blue there. Um, it's also split into your on-site baseline, your on-site post-development and your off-site baseline and your off-site post-development. So if you're an off-site provider, you would fill in the off-site section of the metric. Um, if you were an on-site project and wanted to calculate losses and gains relative to your, your site, you'd use the on-site um, section of the metric. Um, and um, so essentially you start the process by uh, entering your, your habitat baseline. So you, you would uh, commission a biodiversity survey, um, an assessment from an ecologist. They would walk your site and they would conduct, um, identify the habitats, conduct condition assessments. Um, and you could start those conversations about um, what potentially could be done to improve your land. Um, could you, um, uh, next slide please. So we've spoken about baseline uh, and post intervention, both on site uh, and off site. So um, the metric measures uh, quality components for both um, baseline and post intervention um, habitats. Uh, the data that's required, data that's required of the area or the length of those habitats, the condition of those habitats, um, the distinctiveness of those habitats, which I'll come to later. Um, and the spatial location. Um, then the calculation is repeated for the post intervention scenario, which also factors in delivery risk, um, which I'll explain um, later as well. Um, and then the baseline is deducted from post intervention to calculate biodiversity units for each of those modules um, in isolation. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, the quality measures which were applied to um, all habitats, baseline, post interventions are distinctiveness, condition and strategic significance. Uh, so distinctiveness uh, is, is a score that the metric uh, gives a habitat type and it's a pre-assigned um, score based on the habitat type. So you'd need to, you'd need to <clears throat> have a, a survey and identify the, the habitat that's within your site. Um, so there are there's low distinctness, um, medium distinctness, high distinctness, and very high. Uh, and and those distinctness uh, bands are, are on which the training rules are based. So you would have a low distinctness habitat, which could be replaced by um, essentially any habitat within a, within a broad habitat group. You would have a, a medium or moderate um, distinctness habitat. Um, which uh, would need to be replaced like for like or like for better. So that would be uh, any habitat um, in a any any habitat within the same broad habitat group, um, and a high distinctness habitat would need to be a like for like um, or like for like, like for like or like for better. So um, again, it would be um, if you would lose a high distinctness grassland, you would need to replace it with a, a high distinctness grassland of the same type. Um, or a very high distinctness grassland um, or very high distinctness habitat of a, of a different type. Um, so um, you also have condition, which again is is um, is gained from the habitat survey, or if you were doing post intervention, you would forecast that um, using the condition criteria um, and, and set kind of a target condition state for your post intervention habitats. So this is a score based on the biodiversity value of habitats relative to others of the same type. So that would be two woodlands, um, be able to distinguish between the two um, in terms of ecological function um, through condition. Um, and, and, and the metric contains condition criteria for um, all habitats, um, all broad habitat types. Um, so, um, um, and also um, for rivers and streams uh, and for and for ponds and hedgerows and, and the methodology is slightly different for each of those. Um, then you have strategic significance, which is a score which is based on whether the development's location and or offsite work or habitats created um, are identified as significant 
for nature. So for example, a local sink would be of high strategic significance. So um, as you're entering data into the metric, the metric will weight that area uh, and give you a higher biodiversity unit score for that um, habitat which you input into the metric because it's um, strategically significant for nature. Um, next slide, please. So um, at post intervention, um, there are additional risk measures which um, or risk scores or risk multipliers which are um, uh, applied to the calculations. Uh, these are the difficulty of creating or restoring or enhancing a habitat. So these are pre-assigned scores um, which have kind of been uh, generated by uh, talking to habitat specialists, um, looking at the specific habitat. So for example, a woodland would take a lot longer to develop than um, a non-priority uh, pond, for example, uh, and a priority pond would take longer to develop than a non-priority pond. And so these um, difficulty of creating, restoring, enhancing habitats are, are preset by the metric. And as you input your, your post-intervention selections into the metric, these will generate automatically. Um, the second one is um, temporal risk. Um, so as you select your, your post-interventions habitat, habitats, whether they've been created or enhances, you're going to need to um, select a target condition. So as, as Nick mentioned, these might be constrained by um, land use, they might be constrained by uh, the size um, of the habitat or, or what's feasible or, or kind of the underlying ground conditions. So a number of things can uh, kind of affect um, time to, your, your target condition. Um, but the, the time to target condition risk multiplier is a, a pre-assigned score by the metric, which which is applied um, based on what your inputs are, and it and it's essentially it captures how long the habitat tape tapes um, takes to establish and reach a target condition. And uh, I think it really it really kind of um, is there to capture the temporal loss of of a habitat and the, the kind of temporal component of a habitat um, reaching its optimal ecological state. Um, and then the, the the third the third one is spatial risk. So that's a, a score which is based on the proximity of the offsite changes to the project site. So for example, um, if you had habitat loss uh, in Cornwall and you were looking for an offset site, if you were to offset that in Lewisham, uh, it, you would not score very highly for that intervention just because it's not relevant to uh, the local communities. It's not relevant to um, the, it's, it's not relevant to the, the site of loss. So you're rewarded for um, creating habitats and creating compensation close to the site of impact. Um, next slide, please. So um, once you've entered all this um, data into your metric, I would encourage you to open up the metric after this um, after this uh, presentation or after this um, after this meeting and just have a play around with it and it will kind of all make a bit more sense. Uh, once you've entered all your, your dent data, um, the metric uh, produces headline results um, and that provides you with a breakdown of the biodiversity units lost or gained on site and off site and provides a percentage change which is relevant to the on site. Um, the on site loss, so in this example, there's a 10.35% uh, net gain, uh, which also provides in habitat units. Um, and it also it also gives you an indication whether the habitat training rules have been met or not. Um, so it will flag if if there's any kind of training rule violations. Uh, just to stress that the training rules are kind of a requirement of the tool. Um, so therefore, um, in, you know that they're, they're a requirement of net gain. Um, if you if you carry that through. Um, next page, please. So. Um, the results page also gives you a detailed breakdown of the habitat area and biodiversity units lost and gained at the broad habitat level. So um, as you enter your habitats within the metric, you'll, there'll, there'll be um, lots of broad habitat classifications, cropland, grassland, heathland and shrub, lakes, um, urban habitats, wetland habitats, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And, it, and it gives you a, a change uh, for each of those in isolation. Um, which can be useful in kind of um, understanding what your site is providing or what your site needs um, to, to, to get net gain. Um, next page, please. Um, this is also shown as a visual, uh, visual representation. Um, so there are some kind of handy graphs which kind of help increase understanding. Um, next page, please. 
um, and also there's a, a trading summary. Um, so on the trading rules, you'll see that there's distinct risk groups, uh, low, medium, high and very high. So, for example, uh, an urban tree um, is a medium distinctiveness habitat. So to um, mitigate the loss of an urban tree, you would need the same broad habitat type or a higher distinctiveness habitat. Um, so uh, presumably you'd need uh, an urban tree um, to replace your urban tree because it's a, a medium distinctiveness uh, habitat uh, within the urban broad habitat classification. Um, so you have low distinctiveness habitats which require the same distinctiveness or better habitat. The um, medium distinctiveness groups, which is the same broad habitat or a higher distinct distinctiveness habitat. High distinctiveness habitats, which is essentially the same habitat is required or better, i.e. one in a very high distinctiveness group. And very high distinctiveness, um, which require bespoke compensation. Um, and essentially um, that's a proxy for um, habitats where um, kind of losses are um, uh losses are not adequately measured by the metric because the value of that habitat is is too high um next page please so um i think i think this this is a lot of this was covered um by nick and his team um i think the key thing to take away is that um it's really important uh that lpas gain familiarity with the biodiversity metric um, so do do open the tool, have a play around. Um, if you have any questions, there's the biodiversity metric um, mailbox. Um, so uh, yeah, so the LPA role is key. Um, there are lots of guidance and standards which um, Nick has referenced. Um, you'll need to agree and map your strategic priorities in conjunction with local nature partnerships, um, environmental NGOs to help establish the local nature recovery strategies. Um, consider links with other local plans and strategies um, and consider your own land holdings and raise awareness among local landowners of your sites. Um, and, and the metric, um, by understanding the metric, you'll be able to, you'll kind of be able to communicate these better um, and speak the language. Um, next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this slide was covered by Rachel. Um, so essentially um, the mechanisms for delivery um, so you can you can deliver on site or off site the metric allows you uh, to calculate units for both um, next slide please next slide please uh, thanks <laughs> Um, there's also uh, the register, which I don't think was mentioned in detail in the last presentation. So uh, Natural England is developing a register um, of, um, of sites, which is expected to become, um, which is expected uh, to become the kind of the, the way of, of tracking units. Um, so uh, Natural England would be the operator of that. Uh, so um, the register will register gains allocated to a specific development it will enable uh, units to be tracked and monitored over time. Um, it will prevent double counting of biodiversity gains and people will be able to access the register to see um, linkages between developments and offsite providers. Um, so yeah, the, the register is only, only required for offsite gains. So if you were delivering net gain on site and you didn't require offsite land, um, you, you wouldn't need to use the register. Um, next page, please. So in terms of uh, the metric and implementing BNG in urban spaces, um, it, it can be used. Uh, it can be used to provide resources for implementing long-term management plans. Um, so that the metric really empowers um, uh, local authorities and, and, and urban green spaces through use of the strategic significance multiplier. Um, that is, uh, you get more biodiversity units for for fractions that are within. Um, areas which are identified as strategically important. Uh, so I think there was a question in the chat earlier about um, kind of what incentives uh, there are. And I'd, I'd say that that's quite a big incentive, uh, incentive because you're essentially getting more units for the same action. Um, there's also additional kind of social um, and economic benefits um, for, for having offsite sites within uh, urban and green spaces um, for the ecosystem services that's provided. 
Um, but as as Nick and Rachel have mentioned, um, the BNG uplift must be maintained by the landowner for a minimum of 30 years, and um, there will be a process of accountability um, if the uplift is not delivered. Um, next slide, please. I think I think that's the end of the presentation. OK, um, welcome back, everybody. Second session of the morning, um, we have um, Rebecca Lashley from uh, the Environmental Projects Office in Worcestershire County Council, who is going to talk to us about, about biodiversity net gain flowcharts. Uh, and I'm hoping Rebecca is on. Yes, I can see her. There she is. Rebecca, over to you. Thank you, Paul. Um, Right. Good morning, everyone. Um, so as Paul says, I'm the Environmental Projects Officer at Worcestershire County Council. Um, I'm actually part of the Environmental Policy Team, which sits within our strategic planning function. Um, so a quick bit of background uh, to Worcestershire. Um, for those of you who, who don't know us, just in, particularly in relation to the discussions we're having today, the topics we're talking about. So we're a two tier county, um, one county level local planning authority. Um, two very urban um, district authorities and then four much more rural um, rural district authorities. Some of those districts work very close together in different ways, um, including three that have a joint local plan. Um, there are others that share uh, services and staff and all of that joint working involves development management and planning policy functions. So therefore, you know, will involve biodiversity net gain in some way or another. Um, Collectively, we manage a very significant and quite a diverse amount of land. Um, we've got country parks, you know, nature reserves, urban parks and green space, picnic areas, um, etc. And then at county level, um, a property estate which includes tenanted farms, land adjacent to highways, school grounds, ex landfill sites, all sorts, um, you name it. With regards to biodiversity net gain, um, the County Council received one of the uh, round one NERF grants from DEFRA, so that's the Natural Environment Investment Readiness Fund. Um, some of you may have heard of, we received a grant um, from that funding pot last year. Um, and that funding had the aim of evaluating the, the systems and the processes that we would need to have in place within the county to deliver biodiversity net gain successfully. Um, and it's been allowing us to do some of the research um, and modelling work to establish what the scale of the challenge might be in Worcestershire with regards to biodiversity net gain. Um, and that work has brought together people from um, a number of different service areas. So I spend a lot of my time engaging with planning officers and planning heads of service, but um, it also involves our ecologists and um, our countryside management service, um, parks and green space management staff um, out in the districts and our corporate landlord team as well at County who look after the, the wider property estate um, that I just mentioned. So it's going to be no surprise to, to anyone after the uh, presentations you've heard already, but the, the burden associated with delivering um, the biodiversity net gain mandate is going to be quite significant. Um, there's funding promised from government um you know to, to meet that, that that new burden but we've had no confirmation yet um exactly how much that's going to be um how frequently it's going to be paid you know or how long for so hopefully um one of the overarching take-home messages uh, for you all um today is that local planning authorities need to be start need to be starting an analysis now you know of what skills and capacity that they have uh, for delivering the mandate um, looking at where in the organisation those skills are to be found, um, where they need to be deployed, you know, what the shortfall in capacity is likely to be. So I would say if you don't know whether your authority is thinking about biodiversity net gain yet, you know, please go back and ask, um, you know, try and talk to the right people, suggest it to them. They, they, they should be starting to think about it. They should be doing that analysis. Um, one of the tools that I'm using in Worcestershire to start to, to help people both sort of understand the steps of the biodiversity net gain process as well as the burdens that will um, arise from it is um, this little flow chart. Then you go on to the next slide. Who's controlling that? Perfect. Thank you. Um, now there are more detailed variations um, of this little flow chart out there that have been produced by other people that appear in other documents, but I've tried to keep it very simple and very basic. Um, it sort of proceeds left to right through um, sort of a long simplified timeline of an application for development. And it should really, um, as I go through, 
act as a recap of a lot of the information that we've already heard um, from the, the presentations this morning, but might allow you to to visualise um, the steps in the process a little bit better, uh, sort of in where sort of where biodiversity again sort of slots into um, you know the, the steps through through the planning process. So I'll talk through the whole thing, um, but linger on a couple of specific points just to highlight. Um, examples of where parks and countryside management um, teams are involved in providing support for the work we're doing um, around BNG with the, with the, the NERF grant that we've got. Um, and I think a little bit about where those teams could be well placed to provide you know, support ongoing in the future once the mandate comes into force, you know, if properly resourced to do so, obviously. So um, beginning in the top left corner, so I'm sure you've sort of gathered from what others have said that probably the most the most fundamental element of securing biodiversity net gain is that this this increase in biodiversity value this uplift in biodiversity units um, it's got to be measurable it's got to be evidenced so the first step is to accurately baseline the value of all of the sites um, involved and express those values in biodiversity units um, and as we've also heard that's got to happen alongside all of the existing um, legal requirements for considering impacts to habitats and species from development and uh, so it's the response of the development of the developer the applicant to um, document those baselines accurately um, to provide that information and government's been consistent in all of its messaging and guidance that uh, that um, the on-site delivery of BNG is is preferable to anything else um, I mean, local plan policy you know local authorities need to support that um, the application and mitigation hierarchy will help with this as will um, the provision of pre-application advice and also a thorough sort of consultation slash negotiation process um, at outline application stage if that's applicable to, to the site in question um, and then there are several options to address any offsetting requirement um, if it's unavoidable once um, sort of on site you know, BNG provision, that sort of plan delivery of that has been maximised. So following the um, sort of purple line down, the developer might themselves own land elsewhere that they can use to secure biodiversity net gain. Um, alternatively, they might come to an agreement with a third party private landowner or they might consult with a broker. Um, there are a lot of brokers springing up there in, in the marketplace that are looking to match up landowners with what um, a development uh, you know, needs to secure in terms of the type of habitats, the type of type of uplift. Um, so those habitat creation enhancement opportunities and the developers are responsible for that 30 year um, sort of funding package to to secure that site carry out the habitat creation or enhancement, but then also that 30 year period um, of maintenance and monitoring as well. Um, and then the, the, the second part um, sort of securing um, offsite BNG is to purchase um, pre-prepared biodiversity credits, which we've heard a little bit about from Habitat Bank. Um, so that's where habitat creation enhancement is, is already underway or, or has been completed. Now, we know that the, um, the BNG regulations will support local planning authorities being involved in or operating um, a habitat bank um, using its own land. But there are different models that, that local authorities could choose to use to do that. Um, for example, opportunities might be identified on parks or nature reserves that are already being managed by um, parks or countryside services team. So two of our um, districts in Worcestershire are currently doing some business case work around whether the selling of, of credits is a viable um, mechanism in this regard. So we use biodiversity net gain as a funding mechanism for doing this. Um, one uh, of those districts wants to work out if they could fund the creation of a new nature reserve through biodiversity net gain. So the land was purchased specifically for that purpose, but was bought before biodiversity net gain became a thing. So their, their funding model for that land is, is going to have to be completely reevaluated in the light of BNG and the opportunities that that might provide. Um, the other district is looking at how many units could potentially be realised from the enhancement and management of existing countryside sites that are um, already managed for biodiversity. Uh, another scenario which was recently um, arisen for us at county uh, is whether it makes sense for the council to retain an area of land that's due to be released for a farming tenancy um, and dedicate it over the long term for BNG and that's compared to the obvious and immediate financial benefit of disposing of that land which is you know always a pressure at the moment um, if we did just decide to retain it and enhance it for biodiversity then as well the responsibility for physically carrying out um, that habitat 
restoration um, and management that's involved would need to sit the staff team that's got the expertise to do it. So the capacity for that you know, needs to be factored into, into the equation as well. Um, the biodiversity net gain mandate will also apply to a council's own development. So that's development that takes place under um, Regulation 3. So if the local authority does identify a bank of its own land for accepting um, biodiversity net gain offsets, this could then reduce or even completely remove the need to rely on the private marketplace for the supply of land or purchase of credits um, to deliver our own offsetting requirements. So that's you know completely separate um, to considering whether the local authority would want to operate a commercial habitat bank and sort of sell credits on the open market. You know, this is sort of purely for you know internal consumption, if you like. Um, so at county level, we're starting to model uh, what offsetting requirement might arise um, from an education subset of our uh, Reg 3 development that's in pipeline over the next five years and looking at whether we can potentially meet that requirement from our own land holdings. Um, and I say it's it's starting now to become more accepted within um, the, the local authority within the county council that biodiversity net gain needs to be a key part of the business case now for whether we sort of retain or dispose of assets, you know, and how, how we do deal with land. And that's a really good thing. Um, so what's what's financially viable, you know, for each local authority, each authority's own circumstances, you know, will, will need to be worked through. Um, there's lots of variables and they change depending on you know, the type of land you own, whether it can be made available for biodiversity net gain and how much it might cost to make it available for biodiversity net gain, because it might be, you know, there'll be a cost for perhaps for if buying out land, for taking land out of production if it is in farmland, as in this instance. Um, and that brings me on to the um, next point I wanted to to raise, which is that an important aspect of having parks and countryside staff involvement in this type of business case work is in helping to calculate what it's going to cost to secure that biodiversity net gain over that 30 year period. Um, you know, you're looking at all these different scenarios um, and, and cost is, is crucial in knowing where to set, you know, your biodiversity credit price or sort of doing a business case to establish the, um, the cost, benefit, cost benefit of delivering offsets arising, um, you know, from development on your own land, etc. So as a service, um, you know, parks and green space managers, countryside managers, you're already restoring and managing lots of different types of habitats on your sites. So you're likely to be better placed to assess what habitat change or uplift in habitat condition can be achieved and at what cost um, to the revenue budget, the council, and you may also be aware of what contractors are currently quoting for different management operations as well, which is really, really useful information for us. Um, if those local uh, offsite routes can't be achieved, so Nick was talking um, about that the government establishing a platform for the sale of statutory biodiversity credits, um, but those will be priced, yeah, to incentivise um, local offsetting first and foremost. But that that option will be there as that sort of that fail safe, that backstop. So when a planning application is submitted, um, planning officers are going to be presented with a minimum of two things that they've not dealt with before, and that's the biodiversity metric spreadsheet that we've just had a very quick look at um, and a biodiversity gain plan as well. And planning officers are going to have to validate and assess those documents and make a judgment on risk and the level of confidence they have in that plan being delivered. So i.e. do they agree with the applicant that the biodiversity gain site has been um, appropriately secured? And if not, what are they going to propose to do to mitigate the, you know, the risk of that failure? And that's that's a big ask of planning officers in terms of both time um, and expertise. Uh, the biodiversity game plan is going to need to set out parameters around you know, what habitats are going to be delivered, what condition they're going to get those habitats into, you know, how it's going to be done. And someone's got to assess that information and say either, yeah, yes, OK, that looks OK, that looks achievable, or no, they're being too ambitious, it's not being costed correctly you know whatever the reasoning might be and planning officers on the whole no disrespect to planning officers but are not going to have the skills necessarily to make that judgment um some local authorities do have in-house ecologists but you know looking at the chat this morning a lot a lot don't um and not all in worcestershire do um but even those staff might not necessarily have land management experience or knowledge that will allow them to judge whether a particular bit of habitat enhancement you know has been costed appropriately Whereas parks and green space and countryside staff, you know, they might well have that expertise. So moving along, um, the Environment Act allows for the use of um, planning conditions and planning obligations, so section 106 agreements, um, and this new tool called conservation covenants as well to be used to appropriately secure biodiversity net gain. 
And at its most basic level, that would be um, a mandatory pre-commencement condition that the biodiversity game plan has to be received and approved by the local authority before development can begin. Um, We've heard about the off-site um, biodiversity gain sites need will need to be added to a national public register. Um, so that's where the, the the development will then be, you know, linked um, to the precise biodiversity units that have been secured to, um, to offset that development. Um, and that's going to be secured for that that thirty year period, which includes that commitment to to monitoring change in habitat condition as well over that thirty year time frame. Um, as as part of our extended biodiversity duty reporting that the Environment Act um, is also imposed. So local authorities will have to report on the biodiversity gain sites they have secured through their planning consenting and whether or not those sites are delivering or failing to deliver um, the habitats that were set out in the biodiversity gain plan and any sort of, um, habitat management and monitoring plan that's in place. So there's therefore, you know, there's a big incentive there for local authorities to maintain some sort of quality control oversight of the management and monitoring that's taking place, um, as well as the necessity for the local authority to collect and manage quite a bit of data. Um, and both that that data capture and that oversight of management and monitoring activity are potentially huge capacity issues for local authorities. They're really, really big issues that you know, I'm not going to go into now. OK. Right, I'm going to uh, stop there. Happy to take um, questions in a bit. I think we've got another um, Q&A session coming up in a little while, but if we just flip quickly onto the next slide, I just want to highlight um, some places you can go to for further information. Now, Nick also put a link to the, um, the planning advisory service up um, at the end of his presentation, so I will, I will second his recommendation. Um, they have a lot of information um, on their website um, aimed obviously at local authorities and there's, there's more and more um, coming on there all the time including the sort of case studies examples of um, SPDs, uh, um, appeal decisions, there's all sorts and um, there's a really good um, sort of about documentation building up on there. Um, PAS also run um, a BNG practitioners forum um, which is an, an associated base camp platform um, for sort of sharing documents and Q&A and stuff. That's run by Becky Mobley and her, her details are there. So if you drop her an email, um, you can um, get access to that. I found it really, really useful, that forum. Um, and then another audience for information about BNG is your legal teams as well. So there's a couple of links there that might be of interest that you might want to to forward on to other people within your organisation. So um, number five chambers recently did a briefing on um, biodiversity net gain. It's a fairly high level overview. It doesn't go into sort of the mechanics of the detail like we've been you know, hearing about this morning. Um, it is high level, but it's led by one of their KCs. So it does have a sort of certain amount of gravitas if you want your legal team to sort of sit up and take notice. Um, there's also a link to an article that was written by um, the Freeth's environmental law team um, on conservation covenants, which came into force just over a month ago. Um, and that's a really useful summary of, of what they are and how they can be used um, specifically for be, um, biodiversity net gain. They aren't specific to biodiversity net gain, but the article does talk specifically about how they can be used for biodiversity net gain. So um, you might want to forward that on as well, because um, yeah, if you if you do go down the route of using conservation covenants to to secure BNG on your sites, then obviously your legal team will need to be have an understanding of what that's all about. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca. Beautifully timed. Uh, we're doing <laughs> excellent. We're doing really well. And you can't beat a good flow chart. And that was a really good flow chart. Um, thank you for that. We'll do. We'll take questions after the next session, uh, which is with Craig Earl, uh, who is senior ranger at Warwickshire County Council. Uh, and we have an ecologist, uh, David Cole, <laughs> ecologist from Warwickshire County Council, who will be discussing for the next half an hour. What does biodiversity net gain mean for parks and green space managers? Over to you both. OK, well, um, I'm David Court. I'm going to take, I'm going to take the first part of our, our talk. Um, um, you know, we've been operating a BNG scheme in Warwickshire for about nine years now, so we've got some experience of delivering BNG, so we want to talk about that. Um, but I should say at this point, though, that there, there are differences between our scheme and the new national scheme, which will be become you know become mandatory next year, which I think uh, Nick Nick White's already uh, touched upon in his presentation. Um, but some of the many of the principles and laws are the same, so they do. What I'm going to talk about will apply. Um, 
So, um, so um, next slide, please. So in terms of contents, the first part will just be uh, will be an introduction to our scheme, um, um, B and G delivery, what's required, how how and where we've done it, and the second part will be um, about two case studies uh, where we've delivered B and G on council and land, one country park and one a green space in Warwick Town Centre. Um, next slide, please. OK, um, so as I said, we've been operating a scheme in Warwickshire for about nine years now, 2013. We were one of the original um, DEFRA pilot schemes for B&G, biodiversity offsetting as, as it was called then. Um, and biodiversity offsetting was adopted by all the local planning authorities in the sub-region. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. So that's about that much as the context of where we are. So it's Warwickshire. Um, we, we are a two-tier authority, county council with five districts boroughs, uh, Stratford, Warwick, Rugby, Nuneaton, Bedworth and North Warwicks. And the sub-region also includes Coventry City Council and Solihull Metropolitan Borough Council. And the whole sub-region is adopted by diversity net gain or by diversity offsetting um, as part of its planning process. So um, next slide, please. So a bit about watch uh, watch ecology um you um county council ecology unit we very much led on this um so and we're a team of wait well, varies it's varied over the years but roughly about 10 ecologists um varied from at nine to twelve and we provide a planning advice service to the county council and three of the district boroughs in the county so that's uh, what district council stratford district council rugby borough council we used to provide um a uh, planning advice service to a community council as well, but they've got now got their own ecologist. Um, Solihull have their own ecologist too, so do Nuneaton and Bedworth. Um, so having a team of 10 ecologists has enabled us to pool out our expertise, uh, which was absolutely critical in taking on biodiversity net gain because um, as other people have already mentioned, it does have big resource implications. Um, uh, Every major, every mine application, or most mine applications have to submit a biodiversity net gain um, metric. And we have to review those, analyze them, and make comments on them. So it does have big resource implications. Um, but despite having a team of 10 people, 12 people, um, we've had to learn as we've gone along as well, gone along as well, because there's lots to this which were, were new to us. Most local government ecologists and did most consultant colleges don't have experience of land management, um, habitat creation, the metrics are new to us. So we've had to do a lot of learning as we've gone along as well. So um, next slide, please. So what triggers biodiversity offsetting? Um, well, as I already said, um, all major applications uh, and most mine applications are required to submit a, a metric with, with the application. And as other talk, other speakers have already said, it record, that records the baseline value, the post intervention value, um, including any on site habitat creation enhancements. And if there's a net loss, um, biodiversity offsetting is required. And, and that has been secured in Warwickshire through either planning condition or section 106, mostly section 106. Um, planning, planning conditions occasionally, but it's mostly section 106 is that have delivered, secured. Uh, the requirement for biodiversity net gain or offsetting. Um, next slide, please. So our standard section 106 is um, basically a given of developers two options or the applicants two options. Um, they have to submit a scheme prior to commencement of development, and that scheme can either include details of a suitable offsite BNG scheme, uh, which it has to include a 30 year management plan and the legal, legal arrangements to secure that delivery and monitoring. Second option I have is to pay a financial contribution to the Warwickshire County Council. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so in terms of option one, um, the, the, you're providing details of a suitable offset scheme that can either be on the developer's own land, um, as mentioned in previous talks, we always 
encourage um, B&G on site within the red line boundary as a first option. Um, but where that's not possible, where the type the site's too constrained, um, the developer has the option of offsetting onto land that they own elsewhere within the blue line. Um, and that has happened on a few occasions. Um, I can think of at least two occasions I know of where, where the developers use land they, they, they own elsewhere to offset their losses. Um, or if that's not an option, they can develop a, agree a scheme with a landowner direct, either directly or through a broker. Um, in all case, in those cases, they need to provide again a legal you know, details of legal and financial agreements um, that secure that offset, that BNG offsite. So if we go to the next slide. Now, this is the one contribution. Um, we put this in really because when we started, there wasn't really a market in 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 off, off, off site offset schemes. Um, so in order not to to block up the planning process, you know, because if, if the section one six, we gave the developers the option of paying the contribution to county council, so that they could they could meet the obligation uh, in the absence of any suitable offsite offsite scheme. Uh, but as it's turned out, this has proved to be the most popular option for developers, um, partly because uh, of limited availability of suitable offset sites, but also I guess it's just simpler for developers to pay pay a, a check to the county council rather than arrange their own own offsite scheme. Um, so so far over nine years, we've brought in about five and a half million pounds, um, which we are now using to to find and develop offset schemes, or we have developed uh, offset schemes. Uh, however, I should say here that this option is not going to be available when, uh, when the, in the new national mandatory scheme, um, so that developers will, will not have this option. This is a Warwickshire option. It won't be available nationally in the new national scheme. So go to the next slide, please. Um, so the section 106 payments, are mostly to cover the cost of any habitat enhancements which are required to offset the losses, but they also include an, an admin fee as well, which we use, have used to run our scheme. Um, uh, so it includes finding the site, setting up the, setting up an offset scheme and monitoring um, BNG sites over the long term. So this really kickstarted the process, uh, our offset scheme in earnest really, because it provided the funding to employ a part-time ecologist myself in 2017 to identify and secure offset sites. And, and what it's meant as well is that BNG work in Warwickshire has become self-sustaining through the, the use of Section 116 payments. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so where? Um, well, I think as has been mentioned in the previous talks, so we've used offsetting or BNG as it's now called to deliver on strategic aims and goals. Um, particularly in green infrastructure strategies. So it's about putting those sites, those off offset sites in the right place to, to deliver you know, those, those wider aims for biodiversity. So we did some rather clever mapping um, in combination with the University of York to identify our strategic areas. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. So these are just examples of the maps which were created. So the one to the left is shows a kind of county or regional uh, flow lines for woodland, which are the green bits, and then you can you can go focus that down to district level and down to the local level. So district levels top right and local levels top um, bottom bottom right. So if we go to the next slide, please. Again, so again, this is another strategic map. This one for grasslands, and the the orange area show the core areas for grassland in the county. Uh, and that strategy has been really to expand those core areas um, uh, by um, by placing offset sites in areas adjacent to the core areas. So we're expanding core areas and linking up core areas, and that's been that's been our strategy there. So the next slide, please. Um, so but as well as being in strategic areas, BND schemes need to. Um, there are some rules about you know about BNG schemes, which have been touched upon by previous uh, speakers. Um, so, um, um, so they need to be, they need to show additionality, which has already been talked about. Um, uh, so, um, so 
they can't, you can't offset, offset schemes that come forward can't already be funded by other means. Um, you can't, you can't um, use BNG funding um, to to fund habitats which have already been funded um, by by um, by by other other schemes, or which already have a, an existing commitment and obligation to uh, to do that work there. Um, it doesn't mean you can't do BNG on those sites altogether, but you need to demonstrate that what you're doing for the BNG um, scheme is over and above existing commitments or obligations. Um, and that has to be met, um, me measured using the metric, as, as people have said elsewhere in this, in this talk so far. Um, uh, we try to aim to get the um, offset sites as close to the development as possible. Um, certainly, uh, well, we aim to get them in self, um, same local planning, planning authority area. Some local planning authorities insist that any offset schemes go within their, in their area. They won't allow offset schemes to be outside their patch. Um, habitat improvements need to be maintained for at least 30 years for a legal agreement. Um, um, also, there's again, it's touched upon that by other people, is that the habitat improvements need, need to be replaced um, lost habitats on a like for like, like for like for like for better basis. So if you're losing an area of grassland, you need to replace it with you know, an area of grassland as well. Um, so, um, so those are some basic rules there. So if we go to um, the next slide, please. So, uh, uh, I mean, d developing an offset site, we, we when, when I was employed, we took a targeted approach. We, we, we looked at, the, uh, we looked at um, strategic maps, looked at where we want to put sites, and then looked at existing data which we held about um, about those about sites in those areas. It could be local wildlife sites. Um, we talked with partners like the Wildlife Trust, Butterfly Conservation, um, um, using local knowledge about where we think you know where, where landowners we thought you know landowners might be sympathetic to a BNG scheme. So we we took a targeted approach. Um, Initially, um, and the first thing you do is you say you assess the site, you, you use, use existing desk, desk information, is it in the right place, uh, existing survey data. Um, um, as I've said, sites need to show an uplifting in, in, in habitat condition or distinctiveness. Um, so you're looking to targeting sites which, you know, local, local, local wildlife sites which are probably in poor condition um, and, and could benefit from habitat improvements. Um, and then you go out and do a, a field survey, um, you do a baseline habitat assessments um, and identify potential habitat improvements. And then you calculate the potential gain using the metric uh, and you put together an outline proposal for the landowner. Um, um, so if you go to um, the next slide, please. Um, so you've done your, you know, you've done your initial assessment, you, you Welcome to the landowner. Um, um, uh, the next, and they're happy to continue. The next stage is to is to is in developing a scheme is, is to write a management plan. All BNG schemes need a long term management plan uh, over thirty years, um, and it needs to be costed as well. Um, so we costed all our schemes up based on the management the management cost of delivering that those habitat improvements. Um, 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 using you know contractors getting quotes from contractors um, um, etc and then of course you need to write up a legal agreement so if we go to the next day uh, next slide please so off, off, uh, management plans um, really basically follow standard management plans so you, you description of, you know of location and site description the baseline habitat assessment uh, details of what you're going to do there what habitats you're looking to create enhance um, the metric calculation shows you how many units that site can deliver, and then your management objectives and prescriptions, how you're going to deliver um, those improvements and those that, those units. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, um, we always aim to be realistic in what we can achieve um, on site. It's, it's one way of managing risk, really, because I, I think one of the things uh, other people, uh, speakers have mentioned is what happens if the scheme doesn't deliver on its targets. Well, one way you can manage that risk is by is by setting realistic targets, not being over ambitious, 
Um, it's better to overachieve and fail. Um, and, and the second bullet point mentions that the management plan forms part is the basis for legal agreement. And so there is a potential for enforcement action if targets are not met. So, um, so we always try to be realistic in our targets. Um, um, increasingly, we're now getting management plans from other parties, uh, third parties from, from um, consultancies, uh, working on behalf of landowners, and we assess those management plans to, to make sure they're, they're realistic as well. Um, um, and that's going to be increasingly important as, as, as we move forward because, uh, as other speakers have said, the market has changed, whereas we struggled in the early years to find landowners to come forward. That's definitely changed over the last 12 to 24 months. More and more landowners are coming forward with schemes, and there'll be increasingly important for local authorities to assess those schemes to see whether they are realistic and they can achieve what they're claiming they can achieve. And then, of course, to monitor them afterwards as well. So go to the next slide. Um, legal agreements, um, uh, quite, uh, I'll be quite secure offsite BNG. Um, the agreements commit um, the landowner to maintain um, any habitat improvements for 30 years, a minimum of 30 years. Um, they must have a legal interest in the land. Uh, it could be landowner or leaseholder. Um, but a word of caution about leaseholders, we 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 have set up schemes with leaseholders and 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 but they can be very difficult because uh, uh, as just a you know, simple ecologist, I can't fell into the trap occasionally of you know thinking, well, if someone's got a hundred year lease on their land, it should that should be that should be safe. But the devil's always in the detail of a lease, and often when you get down to get lawyers involved, they find clauses in the lease which prevent a BND scheme on leaseholders' land. So you should enter enter schemes with leaseholders with a bit of caution. Um, 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 where landowners are selling BNG credits direct to developers, um, they're required to register that scheme with Watch County Council uh, and sign a legal agreement. So we, at the moment, we have one large landowner, one large estate in the south of the county, that is selling units directly on the, onto the market. They're selling them directly to landowners, uh, to, to developers to offset losses. Um, and that scheme has been registered with us. Uh, and what that meant is we we reviewed the management plan, uh, as I said before, to to assess whether it's whether it, what they're proposing was was realistic and suitable to the site. Um, it also requires them to to notify us every time they sell units, so we're keeping a track of the units which are being sold, and 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 we monitor the scheme as well. Um, um, BNG schemes on council land are secured by MOU. We can't have legal agreement with ourselves, so they're secured by memorandum of understanding. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so who who we set schemes up with? Well, private landowners, small and large. I mentioned one large estate already. Um, we've we set up schemes at small, um, on small uh, small sites as well. Um, we've set up a scheme with one parish council. Um, District Council, um, we've got a case study below about one of the sites, but we've also we've written management plans for, for other, other boroughs and districts in the county as well who want to set up schemes on their own land. Um, county Council, uh, Country Park, which Craig will talk about in a moment, um, two landfill, landfill sites, and also we've set up two schemes on small farm holdings. So again, I think that was mentioned by a previous talk as well. So basically the farm tenant uh, when the farm tenant has come up for renewal, we've we, we've inserted into the uh, into the agreement the requirement to manage one or two fields on those on those farms as as hay meadows. Um, so um, next slide, please. Okay, this is the case studies. We've got two case studies. Uh, the first one Craig is going to talk about. It's uh, right in Port Country Park, and Craig is a senior ranger there. So I'll let Craig take over now. Yeah, hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. As uh, David said, my name's uh, Craig Earl. I'm a senior ranger who's based at uh, Wright and Paul's Country Park, uh, where we've been running this this case study. Um, uh, so basically, the site is uh, an old sand and gravel quarry. It's 99 acres in size. Um, following on from the, the quarry, it was then a landfill site. Uh, and then after that, uh, in sort of 1996, it became uh, became a country park. Um, so it's been through uh, through a number of sort of industrial uh, phases before it got to that point. 
OK, if you could have the next slide, please. Yeah, so we're looking to manage um, this particular area um, in conjunction with the, the ecology unit. Um, we've got a 17 acre plot um, that uh, we earmarked for uh, BNG um, that uh, set up in, I think, 16, 2016. Um, we've done various sort of early intervention controls and I'll, I'll sort of cover this again this afternoon um, in the um, in the workshop. But uh, uh, the key early, early work was stock proof fencing. Uh, we'd had grazing tenants on this site for quite a few years prior to uh, BNG or offsetting as it was um, coming into force on it, um, but it had been somewhat sketchy um, and the uh, the fencing was not in a, a particularly great state so one of the first sort of capital investments for the project was to sort of ensure that we had a, a good solid fence um, because one of the other tenants of management was going to be grazing that was going to be an important part of the, uh, the ecological management of, of this meadow um, basically on hay meadow principles so uh, yeah an annual hay cut uh, in, in sort of late summer, early autumn, um, followed by grazing over winter. Um, we sowed some yellow rattle and uh, yeah, we've done some brush harvested seed and I'll cover that in a little bit more detail this afternoon as well. Um, and then uh, David and his team been helpful in, in sort of some annual monitoring as well. Uh, but we've also done a bit of sort of bespoke uh, local uh, monitoring with, with sort of in-house uh, staff as well that sort of out with the formal arrangement but it helps inform um, sort of progress in terms of um, ecological gain. Okay next slide please. Right that seems to have uh, <laughs> over to uh, yourself again Dave. Uh, okay well I thought there's more slides about the um, for the uh, Right and pause, but anyway, this is case study two, which is very different because this is um, this basically it's two small fields um, in the centre of Warwick, uh, well, on the edge of Warwick Town Centre, uh, owned by the district council. Um, they were grassland dominated, poor semi improved grassland, um, so it's just under a hectare. So uh, that is um, obviously a very small site in biodiversity offset teams terms. But th there is now, I think, um, a trend, I believe, that offset sites need to be large. At large scale, but we've 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 always um, been open to small sites, um, especially where they can deliver good quality schemes by committed landowners. Um, so we'd never excluded small sites, and this you know this this opportunity came to us to work with a, with the district council on 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 improving two small fields in the town centre, um, which are part of a network of, of open spaces in Warwick Town. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So, um, so I'm not sure if you can see my, my my cursor, but the offset side is actually up in the top uh, top left of um, of the site, not far from the white bypass. And and to the south, you've got um, white racecourse, which is also called um, 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 oh, was it called Saint Mary's Land, which is a large open space, um, includes a local wildlife site, which has been designated for its grassland interest. Um, and then further uh, west into town, you've got Priory Park, which is an open, um, uh, just south of the railway, which is an open space of woodland and, and grassland, part of which is managed as a long grass meadow by the by district council, has been for about 20 years. And then you've got St Nicholas's Park further south, which is uh, a mixed site, includes formal areas, play, children's play areas, tennis courts, football pitches, but also again, down by the river, on the River Avon, the, uh, the council they've been managing the grassland there for, as well as flower meadows for, for many many years so it fits in with a network of of existing sites um, many of which have been managed by the district council for many years already um, so um, yep yeah, so next slide please so again you know we working with the council we've we saw you in 2018 it took a little time to establish um, I think partly because we had a pretty warm winter one year, so it did that hit the yellow rattle, but it's now establishing well. And this year we've put a wildflower mix down um, this autumn, just just last week, in fact. 
and and the hay is cut by Rochester Council under their cross-cutting contracts with their with their contractor. So we we, we work you know work in partnership with them on that side. Uh, next slide, please. So I think this is the last slide. But just you know, I think I just want to emphasise, which I think other talkers already have, is uh, delivering B&G does have big resource implications in terms of skills and time, um, and and we've been able to do it in Warwickshire because we've had a, a big team of ecologists, um, but also we've worked in partnership with other local authorities and with Country Parks, with Craig's team. And it's sharing their skills and knowledge, which has enabled us to do um, to deliver B&G in the county. Um, uh, but as other talks have said, it, it is an opportunity there for parks. You know, it can deliver long term sustainable funding, for habitat creation and enforcement uh, enhancement. Uh, but it is a commitment. It is 30 years. Um, and as I said already, they must show additionality. So any habitat enhancements must be over and above those which you've already committed to doing through an existing management plan or obligations. So um, I think that was the last I think that's the last slide, I think. So if we go to the next one. Oh no. Oh yeah. So yeah, so I've just said that. So you need the right skills and knowledge to develop schemes from inception to implementation. So initial, you know, you need people who can carry out surveys. Um, Using UK Hab, which is now the new new classification system for use in the DEFRA metric. Condition assessments uh, must have experience in habitat creation enhancement and management, uh, working knowledge of the metric, and, and be able to produce management plans. So that is, I think, definitely the last slide. So, yeah.